thanks for coming, everyone, and, and welcome to today's Grit Technology Impact Series session. Um, we are excited uh, today to have Kyle Keogh of T99 back to, to campus uh, from Google yes. on Google's 20th birthday. Yes. As I found out when I came here. Yeah. Yes. A pretty, a pretty good testament to the transformational power of technology. Just through 20 years, I said, was talking with someone else this morning about this. That's it. 20? Oh. Boy, I thought it was a lot longer than that. They just have been a part of our lives for so long. So, um, you know, this year, the Center for Digital Strategies through the series is focusing on emerging technologies. Um, and, and we're going to turn it over to Kyle in a bit to talk about the disruptive power of technology and emerging technologies and self driving cars and the auto sector and kind of what's happening. Um, he, he, uh, I'll let him introduce himself. but. Please join me in welcoming Kyle back to campus on this nice fall day, and and happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So it's great to be back. It is very strange to sit in this room. You know, there's I've come up here for Google recruiting a few times, and we're in the in the newer building. But this is literally I remember my first class in this room in 1997. It's a little nicer. Don't get me wrong, but it definitely feels the same. Um, so thank you guys for taking the time. In a minute, I'm going to ask you what you want to cover in this session, what you want to get out of it. So just think about that a little bit. I have a set of things to cover, don't worry. But I also want to make sure this is really relevant for you, for all of you. Um, and I teach a class at NYU, and I do the same approach because this is you're paying for your own education. This is your time. You're paying your money and your time. I want to make sure you get something out of it. And so I'm, we're going to talk about digital disruption and the auto industry in particular. But I can go a lot broader than that. Um, by way of background on me. Uh, I went to Hamilton College, uh, spent my junior year at the London School of Economics, met my wife in college. Um, I then worked at JP Morgan for three years. Uh, I got married, and my wife and I uh, were coupled together at Tuck. So we were actually both, we were classmates. Is there anyone this year, in, in right now, who are couples that came in married? Oh, not married, but yeah, we're coupled. There's actually six <laughs> couples. Okay. Uh, they're 220s. I think two or three of the couples are married. Very nice, okay. Yep. So we're still married. We're doing great. We had a great time. Um, it's, only, it's, been 20, it's been 22 years now. Um, so my wife Liz and I came in, and I remember specifically being in this room. Uh, coming out of uh, here, I went to McKinsey. So I actually followed the exact op the inverse path that Stephanie did. I was at McKinsey for about three and a half years. I spent two years at a late stage startup, two years at IBM, and I've been at Google for 11 years. Part of it was running part of uh, strategy and operations. And then I ran our media sales to the telecom industry, did a brief stint in uh, Google Fiber, which we can talk about if you want at all. And then for the last 15 months, have been leading our industry uh, efforts for the imports in the auto industry. So that's sort of a rough on me, just to give you some background. I was going to talk in particular about digital disruption, some overall principles, and then apply it to the auto industry. But are there, other th are there things that people want to make sure, are burning questions people had that they wanted to make sure we address? I can make sure to work it all in, don't worry. Go ahead. I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience working on Fiber. Sure. The sort of real estate element of getting into an industry which is so dominated by the auto industry. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Y
Right, next question right here. Yeah, I'd love to think, uh, understand more how you think about buy versus build and some of the innovative aspects, like what makes an acquisition really attractive versus developing technology in house. Okay, that was great. Very good question. Um, I'm more curious about how Google deals with innovation in terms of when you are looking at a certain development and uh, if, if Google looks at on, the, on the market, how other tech possible competitive com um, competitive technologies are also developing. I also have in my mind the, the example of the airship and the airplane. Okay. Well, where the airship was almost reaching perf engineering perfection, yep. then came the airplane, okay. and all, all of this was destroyed. So, and, and not just for um, self-driving cars, it's like, how is the Google philosophy on innovation in this context? Okay. So the impact mm -hmm. on other industries, okay. Car ownership versus on-demand transportation, and specifically how you think about pricing between those two. All right. Next two here. Yeah, um, is Google thinking on building <coughs> software that can be applied to every car, or only building Google cars? Okay, software versus or of Android versus Google phone. Okay. Okay. Any others? Right. That's a good list. Okay. That really rushes us through the first portion of it right to the second, which is great. Um, okay. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the features around digital disruption, how we think about it, and how I think about it. Um, and then we'll go into the particular, some of the auto industry, what's happening right now. But I'll spend most of the time, I'm going to go through that in about five, ten minutes. And then I'll spend most of the time, it sounds like, on the driverless cars part of it, which is good to know. Um, so there's an overall guiding thought on, dig on any disruption that goes on, which is, Bill G and Bill Gates, interesting for a Google person to come in and give a Microsoft quote, but less happens in two years than you think, but more happens in 10 years than you'd imagined. Goes back to it's Google's 20th birthday, right? If you'd pictured Google 20 years ago, you never would have pictured where Google is today, right? Seven products with over a billion users, 85,000 employees, $130 billion in revenue, and growing at 20% year on year in sales. Um, 20 years ago, I sat in your seats. Clearly, if I'd thought of it, I would have tried to get into Google at that point instead of going to McKinsey. That would have been a much better call. Um, I wouldn't actually be here. I'd be hanging out somewhere else. But uh, because when you sit inside Google on a daily basis, you actually get frustrated. You're like, we're not moving fast enough. And you'd actually say, a company like Google, you'd be like, well, you must clearly move very fast. But if you're sitting in our seat, it feels like it's glacial sometimes. But then you have to look back over a longer period of time and you see ch incredible change. And the changes are very different than you would have actually anticipated. Um, and so like, and I took a year and a half off to, or not off, I took, I went for a year and a half to Google Fiber. A lot of stuff actually changed in a year and a half and it was actually really helpful to see it. Because if you see it every day, you, don't, you sort of don't breathe it. But the in interesting impact of this is we'll talk about driverless cars. The debate I had with my class is in 10 years, will more driverless cars be sold or will more regular driver cars be sold? And that's not what will be more on the street because it'll probably at least take at least 10, it will take more than 10 years to have more driverless cars in the street. But how do you think about what are those characteristics and what would happen? And the answer probably is that what I'm thinking about and what we're going to talk about here in 10 years will not look like what actually comes through to your airship versus airplane analogy. Um, but you have to ask, figure out what those right questions are and prepare for a future either way. But, l but very likely not much will happen in the next two years. Um, there are four main considerations that I'll roll through pretty quickly here, but they'll come back as we talk about driverless cars. Um, great Harvard Business School professor um, focused in on, you have to think about what is the job to be done on any innovation, right? Not am I replacing an existing product, but what is the end need that I am, t that I am going after? And when you solve that, you generally succeed. If you build a better mousetrap, you do not succeed. If you look at disruptions in any market, the airship versus the airplane, Airplane got the job done a lot faster. I needed to, the job was I need to be from New York to LA in a period of time. Not I want a beautiful scenic route, ride and it wants to feel like a train and, and all, all these other things. 
it needed to be, the job was I need transportation from here to there, and it did it very, very well. When the iPhone came out and uh, eliminated basically the BlackBerry, it did a totally different job. It didn't just build a better mobile so phone, it did a totally different function. In the autonomous industry, we're gonna have to make sure that on cars, for instance, that it does, it talks about the job. And that will inform a lot of the questions here, I think, on ownership versus on demand. Because the job is not uh, dr owning a car. The job is I need transportation from one spot to another, wh when I want it, where I want it, and at an affordable price. And that's the job to be done. The second is you need to think about the value chain. Um, and the best spots to make changes are where you're only changing a small portion of the value chain. And you take advantage of all the other areas. So one of the things going on in the auto industry right now is there's something called Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. I imagine some of you have seen them if you don't already have it already. Um, those go in, they, they have to fit in a certain spot in the value chain, but they leverage off your phone. So it's actually a relatively seamless way to get you in there, right? It's products you've already used. It's Waze, it's you know, Pandora, it's Spotify, it's Maps. Um, though it starts with those products because it's an easy, simple thing to do and all you're doing is changing one thing. So any change that goes on, you should think about how am I using the value chain to get advantage out of it and how am I not trying to sort of go in too many different spots. When you go in and um, BMW came out about 10 years with run flat tires, they actually totally failed. I think one of your professors did a fantastic uh, book on it. Um, and it didn't work because it changed too much stuff. You need to slot into what and to make the change easy. The third is there's something called the Perez surge cycle, which is stuff starts, it takes a long time to get started, and then when it hits an inflection point, it goes from multiple competitors to just a couple. And uh, where are you in that cycle, and how do you have the funding to last through this? How are you thinking about your business around how you, how you get to that? And lastly, what is the market ready to be disrupted, right? Some markets are, some markets don't make sense. Um, like the automotive dealer model doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's not yet ready to be disrupted. Um, because we'll look at some of the other things later on that I don't think it's fully fundamentally ready to be disrupted. Like it, we looked at, should you go out and, and eliminate auto dealerships? Because I imagine almost everybody's bought a car at some point now. And going to an auto dealership is one of the more painful experiences right up there with the DMV and paying your taxes. But it's still sort of a necessary even until we find the right area. So if we look at those, the jobs to be done is, what are you trying to accomplish? You don't buy a hammer, you buy the ability to pound in nails, right? How are you trying to do that? should change the way you think about it. If we think about the value chain, there's sort of four main functions of the value chain. There's the content, there's curation, there's the device, and then there's distribution. If you're gonna change in driverless cars, for instance, and goes back to the question on do you use software and, and or hardware, if you try to build the car, change the software, build all the programming capabilities for it, what are your odds of success? Or do you find a way to take advantage of the value chain and change just one or two things in it? Like in an ideal world, you'd wind up with driverless cars that would be able to work with any existing car. That's probably gonna be hard, Op interoperability is tough. But should you be able to get it so that it plugs into almost any car that's newly manufactured? That would take advantage of the entire value chain and make things a lot simpler. That is what Android Auto is doing, is saying, I'm not gonna build new cars. I wanna slot into every car that gets made. Right now you have Andro something like Android Auto or so CarPlay already. It's your phone. Like how many of you use Waze on your phone while you're driving? Even up here, it's probably helpful, right? Definitely as you get down to New York City, extremely helpful. Um, you're just basically, by putting Android Auto or CarPlay in the car, you're just taking what was an already existing behavior and making it easy to change, because you're changing one thing within the value chain. Um, the other one is, you actually need to be number one or number two in any, almost any market to win. Right, we, people talk about Facebook and Google as a digital duopoly, and they talk about it in not the nicest ways. But underneath it, in almost any market, there, is, there are one or two winners. There are increasing returns to scale, right? This is not a new phenomenon, but it very much exists in, um, in the digital world, and it happens faster in the digital world than it does in other markets, right? Google's been around for 20 years. 10 years in, it was fairly clear that Google had sort of won in search, right? What's interesting is Amazon now is coming out with Alexa and may actually obviate the need for search, right? The threat is not that someone does search better than Google. The question is that someone solves the, the thing that you're trying to solve with search better. That they don't look and require keywords. They don't require you to go in there. They don't send you to different pages. They just give you the answers. And they anticipate your questions. 
and they help you in your life and they solve an underlying need so that all of a sudden you're just not going to Google 50 times a day. You're going 30 and then you're going 20 and then you just don't go at all. Um, but it's unlikely that someone's just going to beat out Google at what Google did. You do see it in some markets occasionally. I would argue Facebook was not that different than MySpace. But it's, and you see Spotify beat out Pandora and Pandora had an early lead. But it's not that common. You usually tend to see stuff like you saw in, um, in the cell phone market, right? So everyone, probably everyone's old enough that they at some point had a Razor phone, <laughs> right? And you didn't change up off the Razor. You probably bought one. You might have even bought a second one. Then you came around, and what, f what came next after the Razor? Pardon? The viral rocker, the terrible iPhone, not the terrible iTunes integrated one. Yeah, but it never really took off. What was the next big one? Blackberry. Blackberry. And the Blackberry crushed the Razor. Like if you were a Motorola, like Google bought Mo Motorola for a while, um, and it was one of those things of like it was the highest flying. And when the Razor came out, and then they made it different colors, they did all these little tweaks. But the Blackberry came out and solved a fundamentally different issue. It's, it, it was an email machine, and it just happened to have a phone. Okay, so Blackberry is the, the top of the world. Who comes next? iPhone, and now Blackberry is. How many people own a Blackberry now? Right, okay. The iPhone has stayed for a while because no one's come out with anything that's fundamentally different than it, right? Android's done okay, but it's been sort of a comparable product. And the next one will have to leapfrog it. But the iPhone did stuff that they ne you never even tried to solve with the BlackBerry, right? It wasn't just an email machine. It was access to the entire internet. And then it got integration so they could all, get all the apps in there. Did your music. It did things that the, the BlackBerry never tried. So those were innovations where it leaped and created sort of a new market. Otherwise, these markets tend to be stable, right? If you look up here and you look at a lot of these, Five, for five, ten years, you should expect them to be roughly stable unless a discontinuous change takes place. I'll dig into one other. Music. Um, if you go back ten years, right, Pandora was around, but it was relatively small scale. It was still the radio, right? Then Sirius XM came out. Sirius XM started to change that market. Then Pandora came out and really, really sort of grew share. And then Spotify came in with just a much better service. It's one of the few examples where Spotify just did it better than Pandora, right, across the board and won out in that. But now, how many of you guys have Spotify? Yep. How many of you guys have any service besides Spotify? Okay, a couple, okay, all right. Um, but Spotify's basically won that market. As much as there's Google Play Music and other things, it's gonna take a discontinuous change to win that. Um, the Perez surge cycles, anyone seen this before? So it's an application of what's called the S-curve. Um, but it essentially says, you're gonna have an early gestation period you're going to have sort of a big bang and an eruption. This is usually when you get a lot of venture capital funding. And then the thing's going to get to a spot where you really actually know what the use case is, and it's going to take off. Um, I'll give you a couple examples. Mobile. It was the year of, it was supposed to, I've been at Google 11 years. First year I got there, it's going to be the year of mobile. Not. Second year, it's going to be the year of mobile. Third year, it's going to be the year of mobile. It wasn't until actually, I think, 2006 or 2007 when the iPhone came out that it really became the year of mobile. And then it went from... I'll give you Google inside language, right? I remember being in a meeting and they were like, 10% of searches take place in a mobile device. And I was like, that's a real market, right? That's actually interesting. And it went from 10 to 50 in four years, right? And it sort of just took off. You see Spotify, right? Spotify's doing really well now. Early on, it was, a it was a slow burn. Then it really took off once everybody decided, okay, I don't need to buy all these things. The idea of ownership over to on demand, so some of the early discussions really took off and it, and it, and it found scale. You generally tend to see this, what you see is lots of players. Uh, let's look at this to Bitcoin, right, to the, some of the financial markets you guys are probably looking at. There's dozens of players. Probably some of them are recruiting up here. Some of them probably will go, may go work afterwards. There's 100 probably plus players. Within a couple of years, there will probably be two to three and when that market really takes off. Right now, it still hasn't sort of found its group, but it will find its group. Hey, Steve, how are you doing? I didn't even see you back there. <laughs> um, and then the last thing is, what are the signals? How do you know the market's ready? Right? And if you think about it, in order for a market to really be ready, you need solid economics and a, lar and a large scale right, to really be a market that's worthwhile to go after. You can see innovation and disruption in smaller markets, but it's much less likely because it takes a lot of energy and upfront work to do it. So you want a large addressable market, and you want to have some idea of what your financial model is going to be. So to the question of Waymo and Google on, on, on cars, the model is, is probably likely going to be either a sale model or a subscription model. It is unlikely that Waymo will build its own cars, right? They've already partnered with Jaguar and with Chrysler to build them and a few other manufacturers. 
and it's likely that that will be the model associated with it. But they have a good idea. It's a like massive addressable market. Almost everybody in the world drives. And it's got a likely model that you could sort of see there. Second, there's got to be clear value to the consumer. The consumer needs to get it and immediately see it. If you go back to search, um, when Google was started, you talk about 20 years ago, I think in the second year, they tried to sell it for 5 million bucks. right? And no one wanted to buy it. Because everyone was like, eh, it's just sort of part of the portal page. I've got AOL. I've got MSN. This thing's really not going to be that valuable. There was clear value to the end consumer, though, that Google saw, but the com competition didn't see. And now, clearly, search became sort of the core of it. And the last is low trial and subscription costs, right? And it should be relative to your value. The more value you create, the more people are willing to go through some pain to, to change over. But the, uh, it's much easier if you have lower switching costs. In autonomous vehicles, it's unlikely that the first time you ride in an autonomous vehicle, you will own it. It is much more likely that you will do something like Lyft and get in it and take it and be like, okay, that worked, right? That was good. And then you'll still keep your car. And then it'll probably get to an inflection point where you're like, okay, I've had this car sitting in my garage. I'm living in New York City. I'm paying five, 500 bucks a month for this thing. I never take the thing out. Insurance, everything else. I should just get rid of this. Or in the very least, my transmission went out and I need to buy a new car. At this point, I will decide not to buy a new car. And that's how you'll likely see the transition go on this. But if you had to first move to get a driverless car, buy it, to, be, to use it for the first time, that's probably too big a switching cost. Make sense? Um, OK. Um, there's also some, I, I've sort of basically covered all these, so I'll just sort of skip that over. Um, now I'll switch over to the auto industry. I'm going to talk quickly through the near-term challenges, and then we'll go to driverless cars. There are a couple key trends going on in the auto industry. One is you're seeing the emergence of new, new models, in particular the, the autonomous, come out and crush the financials of a lot of the companies. In the last, uh, last six, nine months, the, um, the car companies have lost, what, 25, 21% of their value. If you're sitting in Detroit and you work at General Motors, you work at Ford, you look at, you work at Chrysler, you're looking ahead and basically the market and all the stock analysts, a lot of probably who came from, from talk, are saying, you don't have a future. Right? And that is actually impacting their decisions now. Because when they look forward, the Ford CEO got fired not because they weren't selling cars today, but because he didn't have a plan for the future. And so that required them to start to think about things fundamentally differently. When you have that kind of impact and your board fires your CEO, you'll start to see changes. And does anyone know what Ford's decided to do in the last six months? It relates to the second point in the page. They're going to yep, they're going to leave the car market. They were the car market, right? They had an amazing set. Um, they're going to move over. The second trend is uh, now 68% of all sales are trucks and SUVs, 32% are, are cars. Five years ago, almost exactly flipped. Do you know how long it takes to launch a new vehicle? About five years. Because it's, there's a lot of technology going into running one of these things. Tesla does it a little faster. I'm about to get one. We'll to see if it works really well. Um, but it takes about that long. So you've got a fundamental shift in the industry that is helping all the US manufacturers because they're the ones who make most of the SUVs. And almost the entire truck market is dominated by US manufacturers. But that's going to wash through as you've got you know, everybody else starting to launch all these areas. So you're seeing those as the near-term shifts. As the imports like a Nissan, like a Toyota, like a Honda step in, or even a Jaguar step in and sort of go after this market, you're going to see some, a lot of SUVs get launched. And you're going to start to see a lot of cars get deprecated. Ford has been the only one who's bold enough to say, I'm just going to stop making them. I'm going to make the Mustang. I'm going to make like one or two others that are sort of iconic, but I'm going to get rid of the entire rest of the market. Um, which is an interesting view because part of the view was SUVs came around because gas was cheap. And now they're saying, really, regardless of gas prices, this consumer has shifted and it's probably done. The other thing you're seeing is, and not seeing is e-commerce adoption. So this, and it's really hard to read up here, but it's actually the question is, what is the shopping preference? Not how many cars actually get sold this way, but which would you rather buy? And if you start at the bottom, most people like, I'd rather like to buy my books online. Like, other than going to the Dartmouth bookstore, which I still love to do, and I'm going to go there tomorrow, um, or later today, right? I don't really go to a bookstore. Toys and games has been decimated. It used to be toy shops in every town in America. I live in New Canaan, Connecticut. That thing's on its last legs, unfortunately. As you work up, though, automotive, people are still hesitant to buy a car without actually getting into it, touching it, driving it. And that's even with a few statistics. There are twice as many people watching test drives on YouTube as there are people doing test drives. 
So for every test drive in mar that someone takes in a dealership, you've watched two or three online just to get a feel for the car. But you're still going to go drive on the car before you do it. And most people will research four to five cars or vehicles, but only visit one to two dealerships. But they still feel like, I need to go to the dealership. I'm going to spend $40,000 on this thing. I want to be there and discuss and negotiate and do everything else. So it's an industry where you'd say, there are 17,000 dealers. Why aren't we having consolidation? Well, the consumer still looks down at it and says, I actually want to go through that. As painful as it is, but I also want to negotiate the price. I want to see the thing. I want to trust the person that I'm going to get service and those sorts of things. So it pretty surprised me when I saw this, because I got in there thinking no one's going to want to buy cars this way. It uh, comes out it's regional, no surprise. In LA, 12% of cars are actually, 12 to 15% of cars actually get sold and delivered with someone ever, never dealing, going to the dealership. New York's going to get to the same direction. You get to Cleveland, probably going to take a little longer. You get to more rural areas, probably going to take a whole lot longer. So some natural adoption curves of the two coasts, in particular New York, LA, Chicago, New York, LA, San Francisco, tend to lead, <coughs> no different than Uber and Lyft adoption, and then the rest of the nation sort of catches up. Do you think a company like Carvana is going to make a shift in that, okay. in that process, like the buy, like simplifying the process of actually buying a car online, or do you think it's just going to be a startup? I think it'll, it'll have part of it. The question will be, people like to negotiate. As much as we've been attuned to negotiating, I think that'll have some impact. The other part of it is you want to know that someone's going to take care of your car. So I think they'll have an impact. The interesting question to me, and I was talking to an entrepreneur about st doing something in the auto space, is how long will Carvana be relevant, right? The, t the dealer could go away, and this, I realize this is being recorded. If, if, hypothetically speaking, the dealer were to go away, I don't think it would be because the market all of a sudden said, hey, I want to buy cars in a different way. I think it would be because people stopped buying cars, period. Or because you had a, cons a significant consolidation in OEMs and less differentiation, and it became a much simpler, more tran uh, transparent transaction. Right now, there's so much complexity in how you buy a car that it actually is somewhat helpful to go there. You'd have to reduce a lot of that complexity. Um, but the most likely thing, actually, I think at the end, and I'll sort of put my view out there, is I think it goes subscription much more than it goes purchase. How much do you think of that behavior is driven by like actual consumer preference versus like laws that mandate that you have to sell through a dealership? It could be. It can be part of that. Um, definitely can be part of that. And the as a result, the OEMs, the uh, the automakers, are not incentivized to actually build the e-commerce capabilities. Right, because they're not allowed to sell cars. They have to go through the dealerships. It's sort of to your point, it's the old model. Um, and so therefore, most of the e-commerce stuff needs to be built by individual dealers where the economics are not quite as compelling. So that definitely could be part of it. The question is, what would cause that to change? You could see, so we, there's, about, there's about 10 dealers that own at least 100, 100 plus dealer, or 10 dealer groups that own at least 100, 10, 100 dealers. They could step in and start to change this. The OEMs have a tough time changing it. In the, they're launching stuff in the UK where they don't have these issues and in Europe, so that could bleed over. But if you can't sell the cars and the OEMs can't be the, the ones to do it, it's got to be the dealers that actually start to do this. You are seeing some examples in New York. There's one Honda dealer in New York who's out in Queens who will actually do everything for you remotely. You never have to go to the place. So you could see some steps in that direction, definitely. Um, some of the complexity still seems to factor in for folks. But it's a, fair, it's a very fair question. Is it? You know, what is causing it and what is keeping it from actually happening. Okay. So that's um, most of what's going on in the industry. What I'd love to talk about then is self-driving cars and sort of when we see this technology happening. Um, and I'd actually love to, if it's okay, have a little bit of debate with everybody. So the debate would be what needs to happen in the next 10 years for actually it to switch over. And I'll give you a couple facts to sort of consider on this. And I'm going to make the argument that in 10 years, there will be more driverless cars sold that year than there will be sold regular cars. Not on the road, but, but, but at least cars sold. And I actually had this exact debate with digital TV about seven years ago in this room. And I said it would happen and Google would, would drive digital TV. And the class was entirely right and I was totally wrong. So um, it does, to some degree, take a question of how long do these things ta tend to happen. In that case, digital TV wound up not being what we expected. It took 10 years rather than two. Um, but it wound up being different than what we expected. So the debate here is, um, one, can anyone tell me how many cars are, in, what percentage of cars are used at any given moment? Five percent, okay. It's, it's at night it gets that, during the day it's about, seven, it's about 15 to 20 percent of cars are used at any given time. So what you've got is 75 to 80 percent of your capacity sitting idle. Most of you probably drove here, 
and you guys are a lot of second years, live off campus. Your cars have been sitting there all day. You probably drive twice a day and then probably a couple times there later on. So there's a real question of your car sits there, it is an asset that you've paid a lot of money for and generates no returns throughout the day. Now you've seen some services that allow you to now rent your car while you're not using it. It's a little bit kludgy. Um, if all of you could use Lyft and it could get you here and take you back home and you knew you could get it whenever you wanted it, wanted, wanted it and you could do it for three to five dollars every time you do it, would you rather do that or would you rather own a car? For me, it depends. So, for example, owning my own car can provide me additional value. For example, if I know this is my car, I can store some things inside the car for, example, for a long trip. So, this can provide me this. Okay. Okay. Others? Yeah, I also enjoy the value of a spontaneous trip somewhere further. And okay. that's, that seems like it would be very expensive if I didn't have a car. Okay. Fair. Okay. I would prefer not to own a car. I mean, having having um, everything taken care of me, I don't have to deal with service. Um, I don't have to deal with the stress of worrying if my car's gonna get broken into or paying for um, parking, et cetera. Um, so the on-demand option would be my preference. Okay, others? So did anyone see read Mary Meeker's, well, probably mostly read Mary Meeker's latest report, but it is 200 pages and it was, it was one page of like 156. Um, it is actually cheaper in five cities in the United States already to use Uber and Lyft for everything you want to do than it is to own a car. The economics roughly break even in New York of owning a car is about, you have to drive about 15,000 miles a year, right? When you go to driverless, if you, if you took the belief that we could do driverless with subscription, you've eliminated a lot of the, some of the maintenance costs, but you've eliminated the driver, the cost should probably be half. So that will say that anyone who drives less than tw in New York City 20 to 25,000 miles should actually not own a car. But it will also change the break-even economics in a lot of other cities, assuming you had broad availability of these air services. That's a question. Uh, you won't believe me when I say this, but I'm absolutely not trying to disprove your argument. No, that's fair. What is the split for urban and rural? Because I feel like in, in a rural area, yep. the dynamics, the economics change fairly fair. drastically. They do. It will be the last to adopt, right? Because you won't have the you won't have the instantaneous access to it, right? In New York City, you can get an Uber probably within three to five minutes, and in San Francisco, definitely. When you get to rural Ohio, right, it's gonna be harder. You're never gonna get to those, if you live on 40 acres, right, to get to those. It's gonna take a while to get to that spot. It will take much longer. And, um, yes, although the trip would be the exact same for whether, you, whether you're driving or whether you're in it. Oh, sorry, I mean, like, in comparison, to someone in New York might be going uptown, in Ohio, you're gonna go there. It will be, there is a real question of people, some people call it the Bubba effect too, which is like, I own a car, this is what I do, I'm not gonna get into some other thing like that. And also from an economic standpoint, the economics in less densely air, populated areas will be much tougher. It will be much slower to adopt there, much the same way as Uber and Lyft have done it. I hate to say it, but in general you see technology adoption sort of go in that, in that element. I actually think that um, people like the ones in this room are probably, if we were living in rural areas, gonna be some of the last to adopt because we're perfectly comfortable driving. But if you think about um, maybe like lower income people yeah. who don't have as much access to transportation, they maybe only have one car in their family or someone who's elderly and you know, lives far away from the hospital, there are a lot of services that are popping up um, around shared mobility and I think that eventually those would become autonomous. Um, like Liberty Mobility now yeah. is in the Midwest um, that serve as uh, a way for people to like access like, very essential services. Yeah. That's a very good point. There's a lot of argument that says you have to figure out what is the first or second thick use case. What is the first use case that people will do for it? Um, people are older who have trouble, um, who have trouble uh, driving, right, at night in particular. Um, for me, like, you know, even if I don't get rid of my car, I don't drive at night to go to dinner all that often anymore. It's just, hey, if you have even two drinks, why risk it? Um, and then you've got a lot of folks who are handicapped and have ish other issues to that. The other one is the long haul truck driving industry is a very expensive, challenging industry that might be a, a use case. But you're right, you're going to work through use cases and there's going to be use cases like rural that are going to take a lot longer to work through. Another consideration is that driving is actually a learned skill. So I actually don't drive because in Singapore you're not allowed to start learning until you're 17 and end up by then. Okay. So the question I would ask is what would make parents be okay with not having their child learn how to drive? Because now you have a whole new generation of people who actually can't drive. Fair. Um, how many people grew up in New York City or in a major city area? Okay. How, 
Were you in Manhattan? Uh, just outside. Okay. How, how far outside? Um, half hour. Okay, so you, have, so you had yeah. to drive. Yeah. But if you look at the people who go to the college who grew up in Manhattan, there's a fair number that go without a, a, an ability to drive. Um, will you wind up with that question? It's sort of like Dartmouth Institute did a swim test. Like, should you, should not, maybe you might not require that, but you would get that question of, should you at some point as a life skill learn how to drive in the very least? Um, I do know some people who are older who don't have a driver's license at all. Um, but that's a very fair question. What else would keep it from adopting? Alternatives. Okay. So, uh, really, in a sense, just creating public transportation, which yep. in New York City already exists. Yep. You think about places like LA, with like trying to build more tunnels to make that more efficient. Um, why do you need a con an individual autonomous driving car or individual cars running around? You could use some fun and involved form of public transportation. You, have you been a lot to LA? What's that? Did you grow up in LA? Yeah, I lived in LA. It's, ter it's terrible. Public transportation is terrible. Although the one train they did put in has been really, really helpful. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, I think, I think that there's you know, a real value in creating public transit. I mean, like, creating your hand and seeing how effective it is there. Okay. Much better of an experience is yep. versus. Okay, and I would argue, so, it's our, so New York City, I think you're totally right. Like, you, there's enough buses, enough subways, and everything else like that. I go to LA probably once every six weeks. The industry that first got hit by this was the car rental industry. I will not rent a car when I go to LA. It's just not worth it, right? I take Uber and Lyft everywhere I go. I would love to say that I figured out the, the public transportation system in, in LA. I have not yet done that. Um, it's fair. You, you will, in some spots, have such good public infrastructure that the question would be, is it worth it, right? If I have a known route and I'm using that known route over and over again, then yes, I would not, I would not do that. Fair. Others? Some, some other form factor. So obviously, there's been a lot of talk about Uber and others investing in personal transportation, whether that's scooters or yep. you know, motorized transportation that's not restricted to roads. Okay, that could be fair. Like you can definitely see that. There's actually a question whether it will actually go straight to drones. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm really willing to stay on that question yet. Okay. Yeah, so. yeah. What do you think the status of the functional safety in these vehicles is? Like, they're still working on the redundancy. When something fails in a vehicle, are you staying at level four autonomy, or are you saying that this car can go anywhere? Someone from Detroit might be trying to go to the Upper Peninsula. They're not even leaving state boundaries. It's not. It could be in a state localized unit, and they can be going from the sand dunes to ICE in a matter of hours. Yep. Um, so yes, I think there's some very fair questions. If we go through some of these areas, there's have they covered all of the use cases? Like, I would not get on a driverless car like a Tesla and actually take it around this area in the snow. We were having this discussion this morning. Like, that would terrify me. Um, like, Waymo is mainly testing in Arizona and California. Very nice climates, very easy, good visibility. Yes, it will take some time to get through that. Um, the question of that is winds up being machine learning and how fast you can actually get the technology and how fast you can get the inputs. Right now, I think Google's at 8 million miles driven autonomously um, with someone either as a secondary or even without a secondary. And every t the, moment, the more, the basic view is the more, in, the more data you get, the better your machine learning algorithms will get and the better you'll be able to anticipate those things. And so the Michigan one where you're going from Detroit to the Upper Peninsula through multiple climates and through different types of roadways, highways, and other areas, you'll get, such great, you'll get so much learning on it that it'll actually be able to cover all those. But it will take time because the early users won't have quite as good of that and it will only be as it builds. What happens if that's the redundancy aspect? What happens when one piece in that system, like that algorithm, goes down, cars break? Yeah. So mm -hmm. how does it? You tell it. Yep. Um, it's a fair question, right? Like, you know, it, I drove up here yesterday. There was a very good chance my car wasn't going to make it, right? Not very good. Relatively new car. Tesla has the same issue with is, I, do I have enough charging stations? There are issues like that that will come up. The questions on those ones will be, are you, do you have some system in, in place that can sort of accommodate for that? Right. If the LIDAR goes, do you have the ability to just back up into, from cat, like, you know the levels clearly, from level five autonomy, which is the top level of autonomy, back to four? Right now, Google's built, and Waymo is building their cars with no, with, no, with no steering wheels. So you would have no backup way to do that. So that is a definite risk. I think the transition period is tough, too. In the transition period of having real drivers and self-driving cars on the road at the same time, because there's a bunch of problems, including Self-driving car experience might be worse because you're going to go super slow because you'll go speed on it yeah. to the accidents that it can occur because you have this blend of human and autonomy at the, on the road. 
Right. So that's yeah. one of the things I see it holding it back for a long period of time. Is yeah. how, where that tipping point comes. Yeah, so in, a, in Arizona, apparently, they're testing all these vehicles, and they had a bunch of people adopt in who just are using the autonomous vehicles. And people are getting annoyed because they drive so slow and they stop so frequently that they're like going around them at stoplights. And well, the vehicle's like, I got to make sure I don't hit anybody, right? Like, they're the safe, like, if you hit somebody, it's a massive story. If you go slow, it's just an inconvenience for the people locally. Very fair. What's the conversation ar around privacy? Because if every mile driven increases the ability of the algorithm to like take that data and use it to apply it to several different other potential environments are like do you see people opting in to give all of their driving data to companies or is it just something where you don't make it an option it's just this is what you give up <coughs> by driving a car like this um so one you good question you i would assume you would have to give up that but on the flip side of it you would be able to get Anonymity, right? Just like you, you personalize and probably log into Google or log into YouTube, but when we go do, use all the data for you, we hash you into something that so we can't back hash it to somebody else. And so you would essentially get all the data, and you would know this person with this hashing did all these things, but I would not know that's you by name. So that's where the general data privacy restrictions and other areas that are going on are going to have a real impact on this. Interestingly, it sort of goes then also in the level of security, right? Anyone watched Fast and Furious 8, right? Like, could somebody hack into these things and take them all over? There's a, there's a nuclear type thing that you worry about. Um, these are all really good questions. The other ones that I would think of is there's a big, um, I'll come back to Google Fiber. Um, the government policy, right? It's all state, uh, they have to do national, state, and local. And you have to make a lot of changes. And governments are not the fastest thing to move. That's why I've seen certain, c certain states go much faster. California, Arizona. You'll probably see a couple other states who will see the advantage of it. Michigan will probably be the next one to go. Because if you're the big three and you're like, we need one of these guys to win, otherwise our economy is in some trouble. Um, so you will see some government policy. But it's going to be a real challenge to get through the whole thing. In particular, you get one bad accident, right? Like Tesla had a, has had a couple of them. And it gets massively highlighted. And the statistic that like per, per mile driven, um, you have a lot less issues with a driverless car. The statistic gets lost in the story, right? 10,000 people are a statistic, one person's a story, and the one person's a story can overcome a lot of that. In particular, you might get a government official who's not willing to take that risk. Um, the infrastructure, um, I believe the belief is you're going to have to work on the existing roads. Like changing the roads would just be way too hard. Go ahead. Is there a recent, uh, they call it vehicle to vehicle communication thing that the NHTSA wanted to do? But it got shot down, and I was like, well, the vehicles, to your point, your question, the vehicles can't talk to each other. I feel like that pushes the time that self-driving cars can come, like, actually quite a far way down the road. And I didn't see a good answer not to do vehicle. Fair. Although on the tech value chain ideas, if you required all the cars to be able to talk to each other, you would then need to change 450 million, you know, like, what is it, 150 to 300 million cars. That's kind of hard. So I think you're likely to see autonomous cars and regular cars out there. Will you see some bad behavior because of that, to the extent that it happens? Right, sure. Once you know it's an autonomous car, you know that if you, shut, if you cut them off, you know they're going to stop. People might just start cutting them off, right? Um, they might start going around. They might do some things like that. But I can't see a world where you would go straight from no autonomy to full autonomy. That's just too hard a change to go through. Um, what will be interesting to see is do you start to see people just naturally do it themselves? One of the biggest excellence to the iPhone was that the corporate execs, when they got the iPhone, they went back into their IT department and they, and they said, hey, I, I've got this iPhone. I need to use it on my service. And the IT people went, yeah, that doesn't work. It's not secure, blah, blah, blah. You have to stick to your BlackBerry. And the CEO said, yeah, yeah, you're not hearing me. I need to be able to use my iPhone. And then they switched all the corporate infrastructure to do that. So you start to see, as you get a tipping point, some of those changes actually do occur. But it takes a long time to get there, and that was not the first use case. Um, buy versus build. Um, let me see. This is the current um, number of folks working on connected cars. 515 companies. Clearly, it is not in the middle of the Perez surge cycle yet. Um, all of them have some kind of stake in it. If you look at it, the venture capital, much the same way that venture capital is going after the um, uh, cryptocurrencies, bitcoins, et cetera, you're seeing massive investments here. The question is who's going to win? We know from some of the earlier discussions, there's going to be one or two winners, right? There can't be 515 companies. But you'll see acquisitions, you'll see co companies get merged, and you'll see new ideas emerge that will make this better and better. But the other thing you see is 515 companies that want to do this will lobby. 
they will push for this, right? And they will create a, an ecosystem because they have, all have something to gain. What really changed in the last two to three years is GM really went after this. Now Toyota's going after it. All those people were lobbying against driverless cars because it hurts their business. Now if they think they can win, they will dri dri lobby for driverless cars. So you get your buy versus build. You're going to sit down here as a company, and Google's done this, and other, or Waymo has done this, and others will, and say, what is it I uniquely need to do? And then where is it that I can leverage? And, I'm not, and if I, tr I don't want to build everything myself. So Waymo decided not to build the cars, right? They helped design it. Someone else does actually all the manufacturing. There's components in the car that they, they you know, all the electric stuff, I want somebody else to do. I strictly want to do the software, the LiDAR, and the, and the driving, and making sure that it drives in, within safely, right, and within, and get you to the right space at the right time. I don't want to do the tires. I, wa I don't want to do the acceleration. I don't want to do all that other stuff. So that's buy versus build. Liability of self-driving, massive open issue. You guys are pointing out there's a lot of massive open issues in this, and all of these could keep this from happening in 10 years, right? When a driverless car gets in a crash, so the Tesla ones, when it was in self-driving mode, and the person got in an accident, who pays for that? Right now, you're choosing to put it in self-driving mode, and I think they're making the end consumer do that. But if you have no steering wheel, how can you be held accountable for an accident? You couldn't, you couldn't do anything. So someone's going to have to step in and say they're going to pay for that. He hates to say that, but that's largely more than likely a large company, right? A small company can't take that risk. One accident could take them out, right? But insurance is clearly going to need to emerge. Um, the Google innovation next waves, the impact of the winners. Um, we're doing a lot around the automotive industry. There's Android Auto. Um, there's a lot of things we do from a media standpoint. They, they buy three, three to five billion dollars. Well, globally, they buy five billion dollars in advertising from us, right? And we're about to go into competition with those clients, right? That creates some innovation and some checks and balances. The interesting challenge that I think people have gotten better and better about is everybody knows they're going to compete. They're going to collaborate in some spaces and compete in other spaces. And to the extent that you just change your swim lane, your probably long-term potential is not that great. And so the people have gotten just more and more comfortable with that. What are the likely business models, do you think? Because Google hasn't had too much success outside of the advertising business model. But in terms of providing the software or the, the devices necessary to power this, is it still going to be advertising in the cars, or is it going to be some other thing that we um, Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, th I think we're going to have to figure out. We're going to have to make a model besides advertising work. Um, I think advertising at this point is 85 to 90 percent of Google's revenue. Which, yes, you'd say, okay, we're predominantly that. The cloud business has done okay. A couple of the businesses have done okay. Um, when we say it's 85 to 90%, that actually tells you that 15 to $20 billion comes from outside of advertising. Most com that would be a decent sized company somewhere else. Um, so, yes, that is an issue, though, right? Like, the core things we're really good at, it's gonna have nothing to do with the core things. Like, I will not be touching it all. I work on the media sales side of it, I will not be helping them figure out, like, how do we monetize that. There might be some advertising in it. You might do some port portions of that, but it will be a small thing relative to the overall service. So yes, there's a challenge for Google and for anybody else to make sure that they can do that model. Thankfully, Lyft and Uber started to prove that model. Right? If you want to do it as a subscription model, they started to prove it out. Um, ownership versus on demand. Um, I think the interesting question here is just what is the advantage to own versus on demand? If you know you can get a car, so your rural question becomes a real, very real one. But if you're in an urban area and I know I can get a car and they'll guarantee me a car within two minutes, why would I ever want to own one? Unless it's a big economic advantage to me, but I probably need to do 25,000 miles a year. Do I want to do that? Now, you'd say, well, car ownership's been an important fundamental right for people for their entire lives. But look at all the things you now do that are on demand that my generation when I was growing up or Steve's generation didn't do, right? Like, you know, the idea that you would go Airbnb and stay somewhere and not own it, right? The idea that, you know, even renting versus owning was such a big, a big, big change. People have already made that decision, right? Rent the runway came in and created a whole new market, right? Those things, I think a lot of those, there will be those issues. The question is, will you get enough adoption without it? Um, and then, so lastly, software versus hardware. To the earlier point on the, the, the whole frame, if you'd want to do the entire thing, you're probably hurting yourself. Right, the question would be, how can you interoperate with what is already out there? How can you make this work in most cars, not just five or 10? Or how can you get those five or 10 to pump enough volume that they could really work? So I know we're going to finish up here. What I would say is, I don't know what the answer is. Like the Google TV thing, I sort of adamantly argued for, and I was wrong. Um, but I would go back to the Bill Gates quote, right? L less will happen in the next two years. There will not be a ton. Google will go from, or Waymo specifically, will go from 8 million miles on the road to probably 40 to 50 million, if not 100 million roads and get phenomenally better.
But this is the kind of thing where you need to be perfect. It's not like search where you're like, oh, I got a bad link. I'll just go back. You know, the, something goes wrong, it's a bigger issue. Um, but if you look at the value that can be created on this, and you go back to the jobs to be done, and you say, I need to get from place A to place B, and I don't want to spend that incredibly much money. If you actually look at how much you spend even sitting here in this room on your cars on a monthly basis, if you could take that down by half and get the same quality of service, would you be willing to do that? And not worry about DWIs, not worry about like taking your kids to school, not worry about your, my mother's 82 and she still drives her own car. And I'm like, oh God, that is just gives me anxiety. Um, right, versus not worry about those things. If you can fit within the existing infrastructure and make it so that it's a smaller change, right, for individuals, right? So that the first time you do a car, it's not I'm gonna go switch over and just go whole hog and buy this thing. It's that I'm gonna increment it the same way I did it at Uber and Lyft. And then when a big decision comes up, then I make that decision, right? I don't switch from I'm not gonna have a driverless car to I'm gonna have it, I'm only gonna be self-driving. You're gonna go and take it a few times in probably major cities, because there'll be a service. You'll keep on that service for a little while. Then you'll start to get to the point where you're like, okay, I'm using it more and more and it comes to your area. And then you finally get to the spot where you're like, I need to buy a new car. Do I want to spend $50,000 to do that, or am I better off just actually relying on this service? And so you'll have a slow road to do that. That is sort of the question. Of, I would argue that something like this is going to happen, but I would also then say, say, that's the current path ahead of what you can see. And I'll go back to Bill Gates. Less happened in two, but more happened in 10. And say, that's probably actually going to be bigger than what I'm actually anticipating. <laughs> you could see the drones. You could see other models emerge. But I think it is. I personally think it is highly likely that our child, that okay, my children will drive. My kids are 10 and 15. They're definitely going to drive, um, and I won't let them go off to college without actually having learned to drive. Nor will they let themselves. Um, but I think it's likely that children of the people in high school or even your generation, you know, that's 20 could be 20 years from now. Will they drive predominantly, or will they even just say, "I don't even need to do it at all"? Right. And I think it's a real, real question. Thanks for the debate. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you.